All right. Uh, we ended. Last week we were looking at this. I want to say just a bit more about the last couple of verses here. Uh, chapter 13, verses 1 through 6. says, Let brotherly love continue. Uh, do not neglect hospitality. Because here in 13, oh, we're in this last section of this, this final uh, interjection of exhortation. And in chapter 13, verses 1 through 19, it's a series of practical exhortations. And uh, we were looking at this section when we ended. It says in 13, chapter 13, verses 1 through 6, Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect hospitality, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember the prisoners as having been imprisoned with them, and the ones being mistreated as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is to be held in honor by all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. The way of life is to be free from love of money, being content with the things you have, for he himself has said, I will in no way leave you, neither will I in any way forsake you. So being confident, we say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid, what will man do to me? Okay, he tells him in, in verses 5 and 6 that the proper way to live is to be free from the love of money, to be content with one's possessions. Now this is a general ethical charge. As I said last week, I think what is motivating it is, his, is the particular circumstance that they're in, that if you're being ostracized by your community, as I have put out, I think that's the, the background of the letter, you have Christians who are being pressured to turn towards back from, from Christ to some form of Judaism, and part of that pressure is uh, the Jewish community is ostracizing. Well, if that's happening to you, then there would be pressure on you to turn from Christ to expand your economic possibilities. You know, you, you would get more work and this kind of thing. Uh, so, it, But it's a general ethical charge that we're to be free from the love of money. But I think what's motivating it is the particular circumstance there. And what I, what I wanted to say is that, you know, when that temptation to turn from Christ strikes for some kind of material reason... He tells them they need to hold firm to the Lord, remembering his faithfulness as exemplified in that statement in Joshua chapter 1, verse 5, that he would not leave or forsake them. Okay, and I mentioned that last week. Then being confident that God is with them, Christians can say with the psalmist from Psalm chapter 118, verse 6, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? You see, and this, this to me is something that is an important sense, an important perspective here. The point is that with confidence of the Lord's supporting presence, Christians can face any situation. See, we can face any situation, even if they're called to surrender their lives. As he suggested or hinted at in chapter 12, verse 4, God is big enough to bless them through it, big enough to trump even that evil. You know, when he sits here and he says, I will not be afraid, what will man do to me? I'm going to hold on to Christ. What will man do to me? I've got him. Even if I'm called to give up my life. 13, 7 through 16 says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the outcome of their way of life, imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, in which those who walk are not benefited. We have an altar from which those who serve in the tabernacle do not have authority to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate that he might sanctify the people by his own blood. So then let us go out to him outside the camp bearing his reproach. For here, we do not have a lasting city, but we're seeking the one that is coming. Through him, then, let us always offer up to God a sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of lips praising his name. But do not be neglectful of, doing, of the doing of good and fellowship, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. I'll go back to the first part of this. Okay, verses 7 through 11. He calls them to remember their earlier leaders. Their earlier leaders who decades ago had preached the gospel in the founding of the church there. Okay, you remember that at least the, the reconstruction is he's, he's writing to the church in Rome. So some decades earlier you had the founding of the church there. And he's telling them to remember their leaders who 
decades ago had preached the gospel and the founding of the church there, and in light of the, to consider them, and in light of the outcome of their lives, which by the way implies that they're, they're dead, but he says to consider them, and in light of the outcome of their lives, to imitate their faith. So these people, these early leaders of the church there, they function in a, in a way similar to those heroes of the faith in Hebrews chapter 11. He wants them to look back to these people who brought them the word of God and the founding of the church, consider the, the outcome of their lives, and imitate their faith. So he's holding them up as examples for them to follow. The Jesus whom those leaders preached, in whom they trusted and through whom and for whom they lived noble lives... He says that Jesus has not and will not change. And the reason he says that is to make their example have continuing relevance. In other words, he says, consider the outcome of their, their living, how they live for Christ. Okay, and know that Jesus is not going to change. So as they were blessed and they live for Jesus, you follow their example. Following it has relevance because Jesus isn't going to change so that one day you wind up following him and now he's not going to be with you. He's not going to be faithful to you. He's not going to serve you. No, he's the same. So as they were blessed and their example is worthy of imitation because they followed Christ, you do the same thing knowing that Jesus isn't going to change. Okay, that's why, that's why he inserts that. Okay, now verses 9 through 14, these are especially thorny, okay? These are difficult verses. William Lane in his commentary, he says that they, quote, constitute one of the most controversial passages in Hebrews. Okay, so that's a clue that you have to tread lightly here, okay? When, when people who've studied this for thousands of years, all the, all the energy that's gone into it, and when you have somebody of Lane's caliber who spent as much time, and he says, this is one of the most controversial passages. Okay, well, you need to be, uh, you know, I'm going to tell you what I think it means, what I do on all the things, but I just alert you that this is, you know, this is thorny, this stuff. These particular verses, uh, uh, nine through, uh, verses 9 through 14. Let me just give you what I think is going on here. Okay, the author tells him, he says in, in, in verse 9, not to be misled by all kinds of strange permutations of Jewish law that attribute a false spiritual significance to dietary regulations. Okay, don't be misled by that kind of thing since grace in Christ is the genuine basis of one's relationship with God it's good to have one's heart strengthened by grace. I mean, that is the basis of our relationship. Grace in Christ, so it's a good thing to have your heart strengthened by that. That strengthening is beneficial, see, because it's based on and reinforces the truth that our relationship with God is through grace in Christ. Okay, so it's good to have your heart strengthened by that thing. On the other hand, since dietary regulations, they don't provide the spiritual benefit that its advocates claim uh, they don't sustain one's relationship with God. They don't create one's relationship with God. It's not good to have one's heart strengthened by those things, okay? If you have your heart strengthened by those things, that strengthening is harmful because it's based on and reinforces a deception about one's standing with God that somehow it's tied to these dietary things, okay? So on the one hand, it's good to have your heart strengthened by grace. It is not good to have your heart strengthened by those things because you're feeding a deception if your heart is strengthened by those things. Now, he says in verses 10 and 11 that these and other Jews, see, those who continue to relate to God under the old covenant, and he describes that symbolically as those who serve in the tabernacle, he says they have no authority to eat from the altar, and I take it he means the altar of the cross. Altar is the place of a sacrifice. So he says they have no place, no, no right or authority to eat from the altar. I take him to be saying they have no authority to eat from the altar of the cross, the place of Christ's sacrificial offering, meaning, in my opinion, which many people would dispute, meaning they have no right to share in the Lord's Supper in which Christians symbolically eat the body of the sacrificial lamb. Okay, I'm going to say a little bit more about this. See, they have no such... You say, well, why would they not have authority to do that? Well, I think what he's saying is they have no authority to do it because the Old Covenant prohibited the priest from eating the body of a sacrifice that was made for the sins of the people. They were, they were not authorized to eat of that sacrifice. Rather than being eaten, sacrifices that were made for the sins of the people, they were to be burned outside the camp. 
Okay, they didn't eat that meat. Sacrifices for the sins of the people, they didn't eat. They burned it outside the camp, and you can see that in Leviticus chapter 4, verses 13 to 21. Leviticus chapter 6, verse 30, chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, chapter 16, verse 27. Those that were made for the public at large, sins for the people, okay, sacrifices for the sins of the people, they were burned. So I think he's playing off of that and saying, we eat of this altar and sharing in the Lord's Supper, those who are continuing to pursue God through old covenant Judaism, they have no right to eat of that sacrifice because the law forbids them from sharing in the sacrifice of a sin offering. They couldn't eat that, okay, they, because it was, it was to be burned. Now, the writer's saying, in my opinion, that the old and new covenants, they are mutually exclusive in terms of relating to God so that returning to Judaism, okay, if, remember the, the setting, right? These people are in danger of doing this. He's telling them, look, these are two Mutually exclusive ways of re relating to God. If you return to Judaism, you are abandoning Christ. And I think you see the same idea in Galatians chapter 5, verses 2 through 4. See, this mutual exclusivity, it's represented by this lack of authority under the Mosaic law to eat the Lord's Supper, which in Paul's words is a sacrifice, a participation in the blood and body of Christ. And they, they couldn't do that, couldn't have that, they, they didn't have any right to do that. So the bottom line, what I think he's saying, is that one can either be a Christian, okay, which means a right to share in the Lord's Supper, or one can be an old covenant Jew, which means no right to share in the Supper, you can't be both. And that would be powerful, see, for people who are ready, they're saying, no, I think I can walk this line. I want to come over here and be a Jew, I want to be this old covenant Jew so that my people will like me, I won't have the risk of being jumped on by the Roman state. I want to do that. I want to, I want to be over here and do this, and, and I'll still be okay. And I think he's letting them know that these are mutually exclusive, and if you go that route, you have no right to share in the Lord's Supper. Okay, which of course symbolizes that you're not part of Christ. Okay, not part of Christ. Now, as I said, many people uh, reject any allusion here to the Lord's Supper. Okay, and they do so because they think that, that ref, such a reference runs counter to the prior dismissal of claims that food are of spiritual value. Okay, he's making the point foods aren't of spiritual value. I think there he's talking about dietary regulations. So they said, listen, he couldn't be talking about the Lord's Supper because he's already made clear this idea that foods don't have any spiritual value. But I don't think that's right. See, in my view... I think that denying that dietary regulations are relevant to one's relationship with God is not denying that being a disciple of Christ, which discipleship is expressed and reflected in one's sharing in the Lord's Supper, it's not the same as saying that that's not relevant to one's relationship to Christ. Okay, as I say, this is, this is sticky stuff, a lot of different views about it. I've just given you mine, Now let me read to you what David De Silva says who at least he points up this idea that I, I think that, you know, it's hard to me not to see the Lord's Supper somewhere back here. Okay, De Silva says, he says, the Eucharistic overtones of this verse have been much explored and debated. Commenting on the eating of meat and sacrificial offerings, Richard Nelson writes, meat derived from violence has been transformed into food eaten in a meal which establishes community the blood that had the potential to destroy relationships has become instead a mechanism to promote those same communal ties through atonement. And he's talking about the meals that they would eat when they would sacrifice in Judaism. Okay, there were various sacrifices you had, some of which that you would, you would have this kind of meal. And not only in Judaism, in fact, in the ancient world. He says, the Eucharist is the ultimate expression of this principle wherein a violent and bloody execution is transformed into a meal that provides a model for the new community of believers and sustains that community. Here's really what I wanted to get to. He says, for hearers accustomed to participating in this ritual, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, okay, an allusion to it here in 1310 is unavoidable. Now, that's how I feel. <laughs> you know, I think that somebody reading this would clearly see that, and so that's how I've, I've explained it to you, but, but as I say, there are a lot of people that say, no, that's a dead end. Okay, so you put that back there and considering what I'm saying. But he says an allusion to it here in 1310 is unavoidable and has the potential to enrich their understanding of that meal 
and to safeguard them against an overly materialistic interpretation of its power and significance, as the author has laid ample stress on the once-for-all and unrepeatable quality of Jesus' sacrifice. Okay, so th- th- this is uh, Thorny. I think he's, he's talking about, I think what he's saying to them, the bottom line is, is that worshiping and approaching God through Old Covenant Judaism and through the New Testament, through the New Covenant, are mutually exclusive. And he wants the people to know who are in danger of reverting to some form of Judaism that if you make that, you are cutting yourself off. And it reminded me of what Paul said. You know, we told him, he said, you know, you let yourselves be circumcised and you're alienated from grace. You've fallen from grace. You're alienated from Christ. And I think, see, they had to see that, especially when you have people pressuring them and saying, no, you got to get off this Jesus thing. Okay, just come on back into the fold. Okay, uh, 12, 16, okay, yeah, 12 through 16. Um, I think I already read this, right? He says, therefore, yeah, Jesus suffered outside the gate. I'll just leave that up there then. Now, since the sacrifices for sins of the people, they're burned outside the camp. Okay, this is what, when you had this sacrifice for the sins of people, they're burned outside the camp. And he's probably referring specifically to the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. Okay, you would have that sacrifice done for the people. That sacrifice would then be burned outside the camp. And since the sacrifice for the people, since it's burned outside the camp, Jesus suffered outside the gate, outside the city, that he might serve as a sin offering in conformity with that shadow. Okay, so you, you know how all through we've had this idea of the old covenant and, the, and, and these scriptures are a shadow of what we have in Christ. Well, he says... This Day of Atonement sacrifice that was for the sins of the people, that sacrifice was burned outside the camp. And so Jesus suffered outside the camp because Jesus is the new covenant sacrifice and the fulfillment of that shadow of an atonement for the sins of the people. So he dies outside the camp. He suffers outside the camp. Just like that old covenant sacrifice for the sins of the people on the Day of Atonement, was burned outside the camp. And then this to me, 13 and 14, very important, he calls his hearers, in 13 and 14 he says, So then, let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we're seeking the one that is coming. Let us go to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. He calls them to join Jesus outside the camp, meaning to join him outside the bounds of Old Covenant Judaism. Okay? He's outside the camp. They are to join him outside the bounds of Old Covenant Judaism and to be willing to share his reproach as being an outcast from that community. That's exactly what's happening to them. They are being ostracized by the Jewish community for their faith in Jesus Christ, it is pressuring them to turn, and they said, go to Jesus outside the camp. He was willing to die out there. He was willing to be you know, shunned by his own people and killed. Well, you go to him out there. Don't allow this pull you have to you know, your Jewish roots to cause you to abandon him. Go to him outside the camp. And I think that's a, a powerful thing. He's exhorting them to accept that rejection that they're experiencing rather than to seek the temporary comfort and security from returning to Judaism. And we need to hear that message. You know, whether it's, it's, it's you know, going to Judaism or not, we have people who are pulled to go to other things, and I've said that repeatedly, and they need to hear. You know, don't do that. Yeah, but I want to fit in. I want to be this. I want to be something in my culture. I want people to look at me a certain way. I don't want them to look at me as one of these odd Christians who believe the Bible, who proclaim Jesus. I don't want that. That's too stigmatizing in our culture. Okay, well, he says, you go to Jesus. Okay, he was shunned. He was rejected. You join him in bearing that rejection. You have to carry it. You have to carry it because our culture is going to come after you and tell you that there's something wrong with you. Even call you an enemy of the state. But you have to be willing to bear that reproach in his name. You have to carry it. And that's what he's telling them to do. He says you have to bear that, you have to bear that reproach. Through whatever hardships their faith may, faith may lead them, they're urged to always offer up to God 
verbal praises through Christ, meaning on the basis of his sacrifice and ongoing intercession, always offer up verbal praises to God through whatever, whatever happens to you. Okay, this is how you're to be. And Lane says, he says, the writer draws upon a tradition of a song of praise which the community offers to God. So here we are as a community of people offering a song of praise to God. Now, in addition to, to verbally praising God, he says that they, they must not neglect Christian ethics. Okay, acts of kindness to those in need and sharing with the community of faith. Okay, so yes, as a community, we definitely, says, you know, you are to be praising God. And as Lane says, this idea of these songs of praise drawing on that tradition. Christians have been singing to God since Jump Street. Okay, very beginning. Gathering together and singing praises to God. That's important we do that. But you cannot divorce your praise to God from Christian living, Christian ethics. Okay, and he makes this point here that they have, to, they have to do that in these acts of kindness to those in need and sharing within the community of faith because these expressions of devotion are pleasing to God. You see, it's tempting to separate praise of God from living for Him. That, that is a, a constant temptation. You see it in the Old Testament where people divorce faith from life and they come and they want to offer sacrifices and do all these things for God. And what does he say? That's crazy. That's my phrase, but... That's the sentiment. You know, he just sits there and says, you know, that, that's, that's, you know, horrible that you will go out and live for yourself, live in rebellion to me, live however you want, and then come into my presence and sing or offer sacrifice. He says, come on, for the sacrifices, for the, for the songs to be a pleasing aroma, they must emanate from a life that is submitted to God. If that's not true, if the life isn't submitted to God, then the songs of praise are are baloney. They're a facade. They're a lie. That's not pleasing to God. If the life is submitted to God so that from that we see these acts of kindness to those in need, we see sharing within the community of faith, and he's not giving an exhaustive list here. But if if, if there is not Christian living... If there's not genuine submission to God, well, then songs of praise are hollow. Okay, they are hollow and they are not pleasing to him. And he urges them here not to divorce ethics from your praise. Okay, so, you know, we, we call people that. We have to call people that. We call one another to right living, proper living, holy living, communal living, sharing, giving, serving. Being the people that Christ wants us to be, a transformed community. And as you said, a transformed community, that's where people see power. Okay, it's not the Rotary Club. You see, it is people who are transformed and serving God. And they see what's happened to these people. They are different from the world. And that sparks interest. Okay, that sparks interest. Okay, uh... He says, obey your leaders and submit, for they're keeping watch on behalf of your souls as one's giving an account, that they may do this with joy and not groaning, for this would be unprofitable for you. Now here he commands his hearers to obey their leaders and submit or yield to them. Now they're to obey the word of the Lord that it's assumed that the leaders are presenting. You can see from 13.7. He's assuming the leaders are presenting the word of the Lord. And they are to obey that, and they are to cooperate or go along with the leaders in the exercise of their spiritual oversight. Now, I've talked about this on a number of occasions. I had a sermon I did on this. I think this is an important thing, because the church, it seems, we, it, it is easy to grumble against the leaders. It just is. And so it is, it is a difficult job, and I have said this before, if you've ever done it. You would not grumble against the elders. If you ever bore that responsibility and, you know, had that, and it's a, it's a tough thing to do. And then to work and labor and pray and seek and do the best you understand through all of this inner turmoil and wrestling and talking to your fellow elders. And then to have people treat, you know, what you've done and they, well, that was just stupid or why did you do that? Okay, it's, it's, it shouldn't be like that. 
It just shouldn't be like that. But here he calls them that they are to cooperate and go along with them in the exercise of their spiritual oversight. Now, this is especially important when the church is under pressure, as this church is, because stress, it heightens the need for mature direction, and it increases the tendency to fragment. When something comes under pressure, there's a greater tendency to fragment, so there's an increased need to go ahead and, and, and let the elders lead. Okay, let them lead. And he's urging them to do that. Now, they're to do that because the leaders have the God-given responsibility of caring for the flock's spiritual welfare. Okay? They will give an account for this. That's why it's a, it's a serious responsibility. God has put them in this position to say, listen, shepherd this flock of people. Oversee them for their spiritual benefit and to glorify me. Okay, well, that's the, you know, it's not about buildings and administering stuff. It's about shepherding people's souls. It's about shepherding them spiritually. And that involves an awful lot of stuff. And in a group this big, you have no idea what all it would involve. Okay? It would, you know, it would involve a lot. And if you know, you know, if you're familiar with the other, they meet all the time. And it's not, you know, what are they doing just meeting in there? They're meeting because they're dealing with the needs of the body. Okay, and they need to be appreciated, they need to be respected, and they need to be thanked. And I've asked before, I said, how, how long has it been since you've said to one of the elders, I appreciate your serving that way. Okay, I think they would appreciate it. So uh, do that, will you? D- do it, because they're serving, and they're serving hard, and they're honoring God in that. But here we have, you know, th- this idea of what's important for them, they're going to be held accountable for their discharge of this responsibility. Then he says that given that they're acting under a divine duty to look out for our benefit, okay, they're acting under this divine duty to do that, the the people are to be the kind of people who are a pleasure to shepherd. Okay, not somebody who leaves the others going, (laughs) you know, not that. Not so they're pulling their hair out groaning about, oh, man, you know, you're just killing me. Not that way, but people who are cooperative go along who say, okay, all right, you know, all right, that's what, all right, cool, I'll do that. You guys think that's a good idea? Okay, I'm in. I will go along and not sit here and say, you know, those guys are just so, you know, they just always do this stuff and they're always looking for this and they're trying to do that. They're trying to shepherd. Now, you may think you got a better idea. Okay, you know, everybody thinks they got a better idea. Okay, but they are in the position of the responsibility. It's easy to have all these ideas when you don't have the burden of responsibility. Okay, when you have the responsibility, they have to do what they think is best. And we are called here and they are called to go along. But anyway, I've said a lot about that before, so I'll shut up about it. Okay, it says they're warned about being a grief to the elders because that's unprofitable for them. Okay, if they want to sit here and fight and push and pull and groan and grumble and all this stuff, that's not good for you. You see, the shepherds are shepherding. And so you want to go run off and do your thing, that's not good for you. Okay, it's not. And so he's telling them this, and I think what particularly brings this up is that they are under, uh, you know, they're under pressure, and it's important uh, in that circumstance even more than generally for them to heed this, okay, and hear this. But it's, it's something, of course, that's generally applicable, and uh, we need to listen to it. He says in verse 18, Pray for us, for we're convinced that we have a good conscience, wanting in everything to act honorably. And I urge you to do this even more, that I may be restored quickly to you. Okay, he solicits their prayers on his and his, and his, and his companions' behalf, noting that they're serving Christ genuinely with genuineness and integrity. That's how Christian service ought to be. Here you have him. He, he, I just like this thing where he says, he says, uh, uh, pray for us, for we're convinced we have a good conscience, uh, wanting and everything to act honorably, and that's how they are. It just, it bothers me greatly when I hear stories about religious folks who abuse trust and do this kind of stuff. Uh, Satan uses that kind of thing. He gets major mileage out of that. You know, people stealing money or, you know, abusing relay. It's just a nightmare, okay? So I, I don't know, you know, what is behind it, uh, but it's terrible. But here you have these guys, they say, listen, you know, we're working in a good conscience. We're acting from noble motivations. We seek to serve, and that's what we're doing. 
And okay, benediction. I've got about uh, four minutes. All right, he says, Now may the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good thing to do his will, working in us the thing pleasing before him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now he prays that the God of peace may equip them with every good thing to do his will through Jesus Christ, at work in them and him, okay, to, to work in them and to work in him what is pleasing. Equip them with everything necessary to work what is pleasing. Now, this is a great promise, right? Praying here, he, he sits here and he says, Now may the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal, equip you with every good thing to do his will, Working in us the thing pleasing before him through Jesus Christ. May he equip you to bring that about. And this is the thing. You and I are empowered by God to be the people he calls us to be. I have a whole other thing I could say about that, but I don't have time. Okay? You know, this idea of taking the gospel and cutting it down to where it's simply, I'm saved, I'm forgiven, that's it. Okay? And that hymn where he says, you know, deliver me, you know, be of sin the double cure, you know. Save me from its guilt and power. We leave off the power. You see, there is transforming work. And if, I, you know, if, if he just left us there, oh, it's okay, you're forgiven, but you're still trapped in your own sinful life. No, there's power to be different, to be more like Christ. Okay, and he sits here and he says, the, who, who will uh, provide these things for us. Now, God is referred to as the one who brought the Lord Jesus back from the dead. And Jesus is called the great shepherd of the sheep. God brought Jesus, God brought Jesus back from the dead. He says, by or through the blood of the eternal covenant. Now I think what he means, he did that in that, as Bruce says in his commentary, his resurrection is the demonstration that his sacrifice of himself has been accepted and has been accepted by God and the new covenant established on the basis of that sacrifice. See, he brought him back from the dead by or through the blood of the eternal covenant in that sense. That his resurrection is the demonstration that the sacrifice of himself has been accepted by God and the new covenant's been established on that basis. Okay, so that's that's what I think is going on in that uh, line there. Then the clause, uh, the last clause here is a doxology where he says, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Uh, It may refer to God, who's the primary actor in chapter 20, verse 21, God the Father. Or it may refer to Jesus, God the Son, who's the the nearest antecedent. Okay, could refer to either one of those. But in any event, it's a doxology where he says, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Last section here. All right, he says, now I urge you, brothers, bear with the word of exhortation, for indeed I've written to you in few words. Know that our brother Timothy's been released, with whom if he comes soon, I will see you. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Grace be with all of you. He closes by urging them to put up with what he's written. Okay, meaning not to consider it an imposition because of its length, because it's in fact relatively short in terms of a sermon. Okay, so that's, that's what that's about. And then about Timothy, George Guthrie says, the Timothy of verse 23 is commonly assumed to be Paul's missionary companion. You can't prove that, but it certainly makes sense. Okay, but commonly assumed to be his missionary companion. If so, his release indicates an incarceration not mentioned in Acts or elsewhere in the New Testament. In any case, Timothy's a companion of the author and is known to this church. The author expects him to arrive soon and anticipates that they will travel together to see the recipients of Hebrews. So we see the author has some connection with this church that he's been writing to. He greets all the leaders and all the saints and he sends them greetings from those in Italy. As I noted in the introduction, that probably means those who've come... That was a long time ago, I know. But those who who came from Italy who are with the writer now, he's writing back to the church in Rome, and he says, those from Italy send back their greetings to you. Okay, I think that's that's what he's doing. And then his last line here is, grace be with all of you. Okay, grace be with all of you. That is the theme of Christian life. That is the theme here. That's what I leave you with. The bell's going to ring. Grace be with all of you. Thank you for coming.